right, today's scripture comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. I'll be reading in the ESV, and we invite you to find the scripture uh, in your pew Bibles, or if you brought a Bible or Bible app, it will also be projected behind me. And uh, we invite you to follow along as I read it. Um, we're coming to the end of our, uh, <clears throat> our journey through the Gospel of Mark. This is the last, <laughs> the last sermon in this year long. We started in September. We are, we're coming all the way to the end of uh, the Story of Jesus series. So again, it's uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's message is resurrected life. Last week, we talked about the crucifixion, and today we're talking about the resurrection. And we know that with the resurrection comes great joy. You know, oh my goodness, that is such good news that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, on Easter, we celebrate with joy the reason why we worship on Sundays and not Saturdays like Jewish people do. Because the Sabbath, Shabbat, uh, in Hebrew just is Saturday. That's the day, right? But we don't celebrate on Shabbat on Saturday but on Sunday, because this is the day that the Lord was raised, right? Um, when I was in seminary, they uh, had this question in my corporate worship class. They asked, what is the most important day of the Christian calendar? And we went over the Christian calendar and all the different meanings. And so there are three options. A, Christmas, B, Easter, C, Sunday. And almost every single person got this wrong. Um, some people put Christmas, uh, you know, they're like, oh, well, that's the day that, you know, Jesus came into the world, so that's really important. And most of the people put Easter Sunday, because they're like, well, that's when Jesus rose from the dead. But the answer was C, every Sunday. Because you see, every Sunday, in a way, is Easter Sunday, is this celebration. It's supposed to be a celebration that Jesus is alive. Oh my goodness, he defeated death. That is good news, right? We should celebrate. To just kind of demonstrate resurrection joy, I want to show you my dog, Lucky. <laughs> this is my dog. And uh, so whenever I go on a trip, um, like I said, uh, I went to uh, this college initiative conference in Atlanta this past week on uh, Monday and came back uh, Thursday night. And so I was gone for four days. And whenever I go away for more than a day and I come back, my dog, I think he was convinced that I was dead. I really think he's like, man, this guy's not coming back. And my wife told me that he'll just kind of mourn for a couple of days. He just kind of lays on the ground. You know, like won't eat that much and just, just kind of like, like he'll like, you know, hide under the bed. But when I come back, man, it is the greatest feeling. You know, he comes up to me and just like, my dog doesn't bark much, but when he sees me, he's like, ah, ah, just, ah, ah, 
and it just comes up. He's, he's like licking and jumping, and then he does this thing where he, he like you know kind of turns around in a circle. He's like rubbing himself up against me, and then he'll just take a victory lap. He'll just like run as fast as he can around the house. Just you know, he's home. He's home. He's he's alive. He's alive. That friends is resurrection joy. Oh my goodness, it's so great. If you guys have a dog, you probably experienced it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I could be my dog. Now I look, wish I could experience that kind of joy. Oh my goodness, that's so wonderful. You know, and friends, resurrection joy is definitely the joy that Jesus is alive. But did you know, we are meant to share in the resurrection. Because I, I want to be you know, honest about this. I know we talked a lot about sharing in his death, right? You got to take up your cross and you got to follow him. You are crucified with Christ, as it says in scripture, right? But if that is true, if you're crucified with Christ, you are also raised with Christ, right? So the joy of resurrection is definitely the joy primarily First most, that Jesus is alive. But it is also that you are alive. You are resurrected. And that has great implications for our lives. And I think that sometimes we miss that, right? We're all about Jesus being resurrected, but we forget. So are we. I think that has some massive ripples in our lives, massive implications for how we live. What does it mean to live a resurrected life? What does it mean to be fully resurrected? You know, and so we're going to talk about that. And I did want to show you, uh, you know, Philippians 3, 7 through 11. We read this last week. And the point last week was to say we want to know Jesus' death, right? And this was, was what Paul said. He said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He wants to know the power of resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And that was the point we made last week, right? You you can't skip that part. You got to know what it means to die, to be crucified to yourself, to die to yourself. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It is a package deal, right? Right? Sometimes, I think, Christians, we emphasize one or the other. You know, maybe you're all about crucifixion. Oh, I need to die to myself. Die to myself. Die to those desires that are natural within me. As we we talked about last week, right? When we talk about dying to the flesh, we're not just talking about like, oh, stop doing bad things, right? Like like there's some like kind of token sins or sort of sins we key in on as Christians. And if you just eliminate those, you're okay, right? Like, Like, oh, don't swear, you know, don't use bad substances. You know, don't do these certain kind of like sexual sins or whatever the case may be. And if you just take care of that, then you're okay. You know, um, but what we talked about is the flesh. Man, that is a part of you. And what the flesh is, is this tendency to rule and reign in your life, to live your life without God, without God's control, without God's uh, uh, influence in your life, right? Basically, I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want. We become a slave to that. And so to die to that doesn't mean that you never do what you want. By no means, right? I think sometimes this is the way the enemy twists these kinds of teachings, right? We look at these teachings and we're like, oh man, that sounds so not fun, right? We just think that, um, you know, the Christian life is the NFL, the no fun league, right? It's fun, no. You know, God's like, no, don't do it. You know, oh, you like playing video games, no video games. You know, you like watching movies, no movies. You like dancing, no dance. This is not what it's supposed to be, friends. By no means. Or, you know, you never get to do what you want. But this is the thing. 
We're talking about the kingdom of God. We're talking about reign and rule. Who has ultimate control? And so with, with our desires and our flesh, if we're being real honest, that is what is controlling us most of the time, right? So it is about control, right? So in other words, can you stop doing what you want to do when you know that it isn't good for you? Can you choose the better thing to do when you know that that is God's will for you, right? And for a lot of us, we are a slave to what we want to do. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe, you know, the video game or whatever it is, the, the recreation, the entertainment, you can't stop doing it. You know what I mean? It's like, I just got to do it. Or when we talk about like forgiving someone or loving someone, it's like, well, I don't feel like loving them. And, and that feeling of like, oh man, that's just me so uncomfortable. I can't do that. You are ruled. Your flesh is reigning in the sense that what you want to do or what you don't want to do is taking control of you. Does that make sense, friends? Right? Maybe there's a time where you see someone and you're like, you know what? That homeless person, I just want to love that person. But I'm scared. Mm. It just seems scary to go up to that person. Or maybe I should tell that person about Jesus. But what are they going to think? What are they going to think? And so all these fears, all these things in your flesh are saying, mm, don't do that. That's scary and uncertain. And so in that sense, in a way, you can't do it. You can't do it because you are a slave to the flesh of what you want to do, what you feel like doing, right? And so somebody who was ruled and reigned by God might be doing something that they want to do and actually be able to stop that and do something better. You know, it's like, you know what? I want to chill today. But God is asking me to do this, this thing in love, in obedience. So now I'm actually freed to want to do that and to be able to do that, right? And so the death to self is very important. But we want to talk about the resurrection life. It is not just this kind of mournful thing where you're just like beating yourself up. That is not resurrection life, right? Because, as it says in Scripture, Christ said, I have come to give you life abundantly. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. That mournful stuff, that is the enemy stealing your joy, right? But to have the abundant life is this life of freedom, freedom to love, freedom to be the person God has called you to be. So let's take a look at this story of the resurrection. Right Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. So Jesus rose. He, he's alive. From whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that we was, he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. You're going to see this as a theme. This happens again. And, and, and after these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. This was likely uh, the two disciples walking to Emmaus. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. And you see that. Time and time again, they're like, mm, I don't know if this is real. Did this really happen? You know, and they can't fully embrace this reality. Jesus is actually alive. It's, it's a little far-fetched and unbelievable, right? And just someone telling you oftentimes isn't enough. They need to experience it for themselves. And afterward, he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at table. And so now here's Jesus actually appearing to them. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. You know, friends, I, I, you, you hear this, this kind of rebuking of their unbelief and hardness of heart. I don't think this was meant to be a thing to just make them really mournful because that's what they were already doing. They're already sad, right? I think Jesus, personally, was rebuking them so that they could have joy. You hear that? They were already s s mourning, right? So Jesus didn't come and like, oh man, you guys are so stupid. You guys have no faith. Just feel bad. Because they were already feeling bad, right? He's rebuking them so they can have joy. 
They're, he is rebuking their unbelief, their hardness of heart. Hardness of heart, what is that? You know, hardness of heart is stubbornness. Your heart can't change. It's stone. You're just stuck in a certain place, right? A lot of us, we get stuck in our beliefs. We get stuck in the way that we always are, right? And, and so a lot of times, you know, we're like, man, I shouldn't be this way. I should have more joy. But why am I just every day, I'm just stuck in my stress, in my anxiety? Why am I stuck in my unbelief? I should have more faith. But I just get stuck here. I can't stop it. I can't help it. And Jesus is rebuking that, right? He's rebuking unbelief. He's rebuking that hardness of heart. So now they can have a heart that is soft. And what does that mean? That is a heart that can change, right? That is a heart that can receive new things. One of the problems in this world is how stuck a lot of us are. We cannot change from our way of, of being. And we glory in that, you know? I was talking to uh, Kevin the other day about, you know, it's, it's so interesting when you see people, people don't really want to hear new things. New things make them angry, you know? They just want to hear what they already believe. Um, so, it, you know, I don't want to make this a political thing, but you'll notice like, like people who are on different spectrums of political belief will only hear the people who are telling them what they already believe, right? So you, you'll have like someone who's like on the very liberal political spectrum. They might listen to, you know, watch like a CNBC or, you know, listen to liberal commentators, read liberal books, right? And then the whole time you're like, yeah, 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 go on, yeah, you know, preach it. I already believe it, but thank you. <laughs> what is that about? It feels good because it is just confirming what you already have. And the same thing with conservative, like Fox News or whatever. You're like, yeah, yeah. You know, and you hear the other side, and you're like, mm, no, <laughs> I don't like that. You know, I, I saw this review for, um, there, there's this guy who wrote these books. Um, it, it's called like Hillary's America, Obama's America, right? And it's like this real doom and gloom, like, you know, the, the Democratic Party is evil. And I read some of the reviews, and, you know, predictably, there are people who had very conservative political beliefs, and they were like, thank you so much for reading this book. Oh, I enjoyed it so much. Like, why did you enjoy it so much? <laughs> you enjoyed it because it told you what you already believed. It didn't challenge your beliefs at all. There was no need to stretch. There was no need to change. You just got further entrenched in what you already believed. And resurrection life is not that. Dead people are always going to stay dead. That is just an unchanging state. Resurrection is a radical change. You go from dead to alive, right? That is the most radical change you could imagine. That's why it's so unbelievable for us. Even the change from sick to healthy, you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. But can you imagine going from dead to alive? You see people who resurrect in their lives, you know, maybe they were one way. They were just really sad, just really angry. And then all of a sudden, they become these really joyful people. You're like, what? How did that happen? That is unbelievable. That is, is, is a 180 change. That is something you don't always see because so many of us, we just get set, we get comfortable, and we get stuck. And so he rebuked that because they had not believed. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now again, friends, I know the condemnation seems like a harsh thing, but remember, those who don't believe are going to continue just being the way they always were, right? Whatever you, way you were in, you're just going to continue in that. But if you believe, if you are baptized, you know what baptism is? Baptism, Richard Rohr calls it a drowning ceremony, right? 
You know, I know United Methodists, we, we, we just usually just use a little water. And to be honest, it's usually for budgetary reasons, right? You know, we just, we just can't afford to have the big, you know, submersible thing. You know, I would love to have that. I would love to go to a, a river and just bring all of us there. And that is baptism. It, it's baptismal. It means to dunk. To sub, it, it is John the Dunker, right? You know, it's John the blah, Dunker, you know? He's submersing that person. I, I saw this, uh, this one pastor who like, will do like WWE moves, like wrestling moves, just like dunks them in the tank, right? But it's this radical thing. Your whole life gets submersed. And I know, you know, it is symbolic, so you're not supposed to hold them there for a long time, right? But symbolically, please understand, it is only symbolic. But you are dying to who you used to be, and you come out, and you are new, and you are changed. And so maybe you were in a place that was leading to death and destruction. Maybe you were in a place where you were only half alive. You know, maybe you were stuck in your anger. You're stuck in your anxiety. And in some measure, people don't want to change because it's what they only know. I shared a, a few weeks ago about how middle school was the worst time in my life. Oh my gosh, I hated middle school. Just kids were so cruel. I was this shrimpy little Asian kid, and there were kids who were much taller than me who would bully me and just say all kinds of really mean, nasty things. And I felt so small. I was small. I was just physically small. Mm -hmm. But, oh my gosh, it was horrible. And then my parents were going to pull me out of that middle school and bring me to a different school, which ended up being a wonderful experience. But when my parents told me that, I cried. I was like, no! Mom and Dad, no! I don't want to go. Now, this doesn't make any sense, right? Because you're like, well, Pastor Steve, you just said those were the worst years of your life. But it was all I knew. It was all I knew. Even if the worst was really, really bad, it was all I knew. And there's that fear. Well, what, what is going to change in my life? And so many people don't want change. They'll take the devil they know rather than the angel that they don't, right? They'll take the hell that they are comfortable with than the heaven that is uncertain. But here we see him saying, you know, I want th that those who believe and are baptized, they will be saved. And yes, it does mean that your eternal destiny is set. You're saved for all time. But when does that begin? That begins now. It's not just after you die, right? Salvation is now. God wants to save you from yourself now. God wants to save you from your life of, of, of futility and, and your, your life of stress and anxiety and depression and darkness. He wants to save you from that now. And it will continue for all time. That is a great thing. And he wants us to live this life where we can boldly proclaim to the whole creation that Jesus is alive. Now, for those of you who have read some of the other resurrection accounts, we know that the disciples were not naturally bold dudes. And especially after this, I mean, they were depressed. They were like, oh my gosh, the Roman authorities, they killed our leader. And they were hiding behind locked doors. Because they're like, what if we're next? They're going to come for us, right? But Jesus, boom, opens up the doors, right? Let's go. Let's go into all the worlds, right? Remember, when Jesus dies, it says the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. That's exactly what happened. They all ran. They, 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 some of them denied Jesus. Some of them betrayed Jesus. They all lost faith. They all ran and hid. And now... The resurrection reality, instead of running and hiding and protecting and being comfortable, they go out into the very uncomfortable world where they are going to proclaim boldly. I mean, some of them are going to die for their faith. Almost all of the original disciples, with maybe the exception of John, 
uh, tradition tells us that almost all of them were martyred, meaning murdered for their faith, right? And so they're going to go out, and then Jesus says, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any, any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed their message by accompanying signs. Some of these signs are a little bit weird, (laughs) right? Like you get that one about, you know, they will pick up serpents with their hands. I got to tell you, uh, there are some churches that took this quite literally, Right? And you might have heard of churches where they do snake handling. This is an actual thing. Right? And then there's that other part back there that talks about if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. So a lot of these same churches, they would handle uh, poisonous snakes, and they would take strychnine, which is poison, and they would drink it. Right? They'd be like, see? Okay. Oh, (laughs) you know, I'm okay. I'm okay. But friends, I want to emphasize something here. If they drink any deadly poison, right? It's not saying go out and drink deadly poison. You just go and test, right? It says if they drink deadly poison. What, what is it talking about serpents and snakes? Now, I, I want to be very clear about this because you might hear these kinds of things and say, we're like superheroes now, right? Like we have this superpower that you will never get hurt. You know, if you fall off of a building, you're not going to go splat. Well, friends, you will. You will. And many, many Christians, right? In fact, all the original 12 disciples were murdered, right? There are many Christians, you know, they would bring them into the Roman Colosseum and do really nasty things to them. And those people did bleed and those people did die, as Jesus did. So what is he talking about? Is he talking about sort of that, this sort of physical thing? Or is this more of a metaphor? I think it's more of a metaphor, but I think it means something. Now, remember in the beginning with uh, Adam and Eve, how uh, there was that snake, the serpent, right? And the serpent deceived us. That was the deceiver. And it said that, um, you know, the woman's offspring will come and crush the serpent under its foot. But there will be enmity between the serpent and the man. And we believe that not only did sin uh, kind of tinge us, but it tinged all of creation. And when we are out in this world, we feel this sort of enmity with creation. We don't feel safe in this world. Right? I don't know some of you, uh, not to stretch the metaphor too far, but with actual animals, you're afraid of them. You know, you see the bees outside. Ah! Ah! Bees! Ah! You know, these animals. And this is the thing with animals, that oftentimes they feed off of our fear. Right? You know, there are snakes, and they're going to attack you if you have fear within you. If you're afraid of them and there's that tension and you get defensive, you're like, what's up, snake? What's up, snake? And that snake's going to be like, this is what's up, (laughs) right? It's going to attack you. But if you're chill and you're still, it's not going to do anything to you, right? Um, I spend a lot of time in nature nowadays, and I'll go out. And, you know, I just love being in nature and seeing the animals, and uh, I go to Gallup Park, and you see some animals that are really gentle, and you see some animals that are, are not that nice, like geese. Geese are the gangsters of the bird world. <laughs> you know, you got the swans that are like majestic, and they kind of keep to themselves. You get ducks. Ducks are pretty chill, too, right? But the geese, man, you know, they're rah, rah, rah. And, and if you get close to them, they hiss at you. I'm like, are you a snake or are you a bird? <laughs> Have you seen that picture, uh, that, 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 uh, those pictures of the geese attacking that, that like, high school boy who was, like, golfing? And the geese, like, 
straight up flips this guy, right? Like, I think he was trying to run, and there's a picture of the geese attacking the boy, and the boy's completely upside down. I'm like, man, what a gangster bird, you know? And so sometimes I'm walking around Gallup, and the, these birds are hissing at me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is scary. And I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to be with God. I'm trying to be with God, but I'm suspicious of creation, right? <laughs> like, what if a geese comes up and tries to jack me up, you know? And as I've learned to be still, um, I just got to tell you, like, like th- this actually happened on Friday. I went to the park, and I, I was just kind of chilling, and I heard this thing behind me just kind of scurrying. And usually when that would happen, like, I'd just be out in the woods by myself, and man, I just, imagination goes wild. I'm like, murder, you know, like, oh, you know, I just get startled, you know? But I heard this thing behind me, and, and, and I looked behind me, and it was a chipmunk. And I was perfectly still. And the chipmunk just like scurries by me. I'm like, oh my gosh, chipmunk's coming close to me. And just was perfectly still. And the chipmunk went between my legs and sat right on my foot. And it just chilled there. It was so cool. So of course, instead of just enjoying like this beautiful thing, I reached for my phone, right? I was like, man, I want to show the congregation, right? So I reached for my phone, and I was trying to go really slow. As soon as I did it, Chipmunk just goes, boom! He just like runs off, right? Friends, this is not a message to tell you how to be a snake charmer, right? But I got to tell you that I think we have this natural fear and tension and anxiety where we cannot be still. Even nature picks up on that. We can't be still wherever we are. And there's something about that, that if you were completely still, and there's no fear within you, in a sense, again, metaphor, please, don't get me in trouble. Like, Pastor Steve, I tried to pick up a snake in this week, and it bit me, you know? <laughs> now I have a deadly snake bite. You know, but this is symbolic, friends. But in a sense, those things that have enmity against you, you can pick them up without fear, right? So much of life, we look at other people, and we're afraid of them. Well, like, what if that person hurts me? I'm going to keep my distance. When we were in uh, Atlanta, we went to the Civil Rights Museum. Oh, my gosh, it is awesome. If you guys go, ever go to Atlanta, do me a favor. Go to the National, uh, the, the, the National Civil Rights Museum. And it is an awesome thing. I think it should be required of every American to go there. And it was the first time I had ever gone. And, and when I went there, uh, the first thing you see is this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. And the first thing that they start with at the uh, uh, Civil Rights Museum, it starts with explaining segregation. And it's not just like this thing like segregation is evil and it's just of the devil and all this stuff. They try to explain where it came from, and why that's even a thing. And so um, I I just, uh, 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 segregation was this thing where uh, people in the South, I don't think there were these people who are just like demonic, you know? But what they would say is separate but equal. And they're like, you know what? Segregation, it benefits everybody. Because if you get white people and black people together, it's just like fireworks. There's tension, and they start fighting. So let's just make everything nice for their benefit and our benefit. Let's just make everything separate, right? And so, you know, it goes both ways. A white person was not allowed in black people's spaces just as much as a black person wasn't allowed in white people's spaces. Let's just, everything separate. We all get along as long as we don't have to be by each other. And so this is what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, men often hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they do not know each other. They do not know each other because they cannot communicate. They cannot communicate because they are separated. And we need to learn how to be together. But for many of us in this society, we are integrated. But we may look at someone and think, you could be a potential threat. What if you bite me? I'm never going to give you the chance to bite me. So I'm going to keep my distance. Get away from me. You could be venomous, right? And when it talks about you can pick up the, the serpents, 
with your hands. There's no fear there, friends. If you drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. Again, a metaphor. We already said, you know, you may die, but the fear is gone. You know, there were Christians all throughout the ages who looked at death and said, you know what? You can't hurt me. You can hurt this physical body, but that is not all that I am. You cannot touch the spirit. You cannot touch, touch the soul. Because I know that my eternal destiny is set. So no, no matter what you do to me, I am safe. And this belief that can anchor you in life, this thing that I quote very often, because it's very meaningful to me, and I think it's very important for us to get there. What Dallas Willard says, that if the Lord is our shepherd, then the universe is a perfectly good and safe place for us to be. The universe is a perfectly good and safe place for us to be. Now, this doesn't mean that you won't go through pain. This doesn't mean that physical things can't happen to you. But God is bigger than all of that. And you don't actually need to be afraid until he says, you know what, your time is up. Now it's time to come back with me. And then you get to party with Jesus forever. So nothing is lost. And so you, you would get Christians, you know, Christians uh, in countries where they, were, uh, they would get a steamroller. And they're like, if you do not recant your faith, we will run over you with the steamroller. And they would be like, go ahead. And they would sing songs the whole while. People would put guns to their heads and say, recant. Mm, no. And they would do it with a smile on their face. You can't touch me. You can't hurt me. Right? I mean, this is a gift. How much of our lives is about fear? We're so afraid. We're so afraid of what people can do to us. And so we don't love. Fear is the antithesis of love. A lot of the problems we have in this world, yes, it, it, there is hatred, but it's not because we, we are these like demonic people. It's because we're afraid of each other, right? The police person who shoots the unarmed black man, I mean, does he hate that person? Yeah, maybe on the continuum of that, but it's really about fear. I'm going to shoot you before you can hurt me. Maybe that was a cell phone, but I'm not going to take the chance, right? It is fear that is driving a lot of us in fear that is infused in our flesh. I just don't feel like talking to that person. I don't feel like loving that person, right? But the resurrected life is one in which, if there is a resurrection, then nothing can hurt you. If I have that within me, that spirit within me, nothing can harm me. I am free to love, right? There's this uh, picture of Jesus. I want to show you this. This is uh, Rembrandt's um, painting that says, Christ calms the storm, right? And I love this. Um, you see this very chaotic scene in the boat, and all the disciples are freaking out. Look at them. They're just, ah! They're hanging on for dear life. And you see Jesus in the center. You see him? What is Jesus doing? He's laying down. He was sleeping. He's like, what's going on, guys? <laughs> We're afraid! Ah! And Jesus just, hey, calm. Hey, is, is it storm? Calm down. Calm down, storm. You know, and, and so I, I want to change this. Let's go to the next slide. G Christ calms the storm because Christ is calm in the storm. Yes, you know, that is a descriptive thing. As an adjective, Christ is calm in the storm. But Christ is calm now. He is calm, right? When Christ is in the midst of something, you can actually be calm. You can actually not have stress. You can actually not be anxious. You can actually not be fearful. And this is what we're hoping. This is why I go to the park. This is why I pray. This is why I spend this time with God, to be with Christ. And that is his own reward. Don't get me wrong. But I also start to take on the qualities of Christ as I spend time with him. His calm, his peace, it becomes a part of me, right? 
and I can face anything. I think that is what Martin Luther King had in his life. Um, this, this is a quote from his last uh, sermon that he ever preached. And it's kind of eerie because he, this is the last sermon he ever preached the night before Martin Luther King was murdered. And he said this thing was very prescient. He talked about on his way uh, down to Memphis that, um, that they, they were on the plane and the public address system, the pilot said, we are sorry for the delay, but we have Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked and to, to, to be sure that nothing would be wrong with on the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And so he's like, Hey, man, I get death threats all the time. And people know I am a marked man. You know, and they may try to kill me. And then he said, and then I got into Memphis, and some began to say the threats or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The glory of the coming of the Lord. That, friends, is the glory of the resurrection. And that, friends, is the resurrected life. Friends, in the light of Christ, there can be no darkness. We are called to be the light of the world. And I just want to leave you with this other MLK quote. Um, the, the Civil Rights Museum, uh, I was walking around the Civil Rights Museum with one of the staff workers in the United Methodist Church uh, for the Global Board of Church and Society. And he, he said he had been to uh, the Civil Rights Museum many, many times. But he was like, I never really noticed that when you go into the Civil Rights Museum, it's dark. It's all darkness. And then you go around and you descend into the pit of darkness. And then it ends going into the light. And the, 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 the top floor that you end up, you end on the top floor. And the whole thing is flooded with light. And all the, the walls are white and bright. And this idea of no more darkness. Dr. King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And he had that spirit, that resurrected spirit that he knew. You can hurt this body, but you can't touch the resurrected life. Praise team, can you come up? Friends, let's just take a moment and just kind of reflect on that. Let's just dwell in um, the knowledge. Christ has come not just to resurrect himself. <laughs> he was not sent just so that he could be resurrected, but so that we could be resurrected. We have a witness to go out into the world and proclaim the gospel. So many of us are afraid. Oh, what are they going to think if I tell them about Jesus? If I talk to this stranger? If I talk to this person at church I don't know? That is the shadow of death, friends. But in resurrection, it is the defeat, the overcoming of death itself. And the shadow of death. Even though I walk through the, the, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Can we just receive that? And just confess, if you do have fear, there is trepidation in you. It's okay, friends. Just be honest with that. And let's just receive God's Spirit, God's 
resurrecting spirit that we can open up the doors and we can go out there and we can shout and proclaim without fear that our God is alive. Oh God, I pray for any of us who know that we are stuck in our ways. That we cannot live the life you have called us to because of our flesh. Because of that pool of what we want to do and don't want to do in any moment. That makes us flee from fear and discomfort and the shadow of death. And makes us choose those things that Keep us placated, but keep us from experiencing the fullness of life and love. God, we want to participate in your death, to die to those things again. We say, God, we lay down who we are. We lay it all down again. We surrender. We want to receive fully your spirit, your resurrection spirit who is bringing us alive now and for all time. So no matter what happens to us in this life, we do not need to quake in fear at what humans might do to us. We don't need to quake in fear for the possibilities of harm in this life. But we can go with boldness and confidence in knowing your love and knowing your sovereign care over our lives. You have us in your hands, Lord, and you will not let go. Thank you, God, that we can live with that knowledge in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls and bodies, in our sweat glands, in our endocrine system, and all the things that may feel that fear. We don't need to fear it anymore. In Jesus' name, amen.